Good afternoon, everyone. Uh, my name is Megan Lowry. I am a media officer with the National Academies of Sciences, Engineering, and Medicine. Thank you for joining us this afternoon for a webinar on the report that was just released this morning titled Reflecting Sunlight Recommendations for Solar Geoengineering Research and Research Governance. You can now download a copy of the report and other supporting materials at www.nap.edu, and we will also chat that link out to you later. The recording of this webinar will be available on our website in the coming weeks. For those of you not familiar with the National Academies of Sciences, Engineering, and Medicine, we are private nonprofit institutions that provide independent objective analysis and advice to the U.S. to solve complex problems and inform public policy decisions related to science, technology, and medicine. For each requested study, panel members are chosen for their expertise and experience, and they serve pro bono to carry out the study statement of task. The reports that result from the study represent the consensus view of the committee, and they must undergo external peer review before they are released, as did this report. I have with me today a few members of the committee that wrote the report um, to talk about their work, but before I introduce them, I want to go over just a few reminders. Uh, one, please note that this webinar is scheduled to last one hour, so we'll start off with a presentation summarizing the report by the committee members, and then we'll open it up to any questions you may have. To ask a question, just type it into the bar below your video player, and um, you can submit a question at any point during the presentation. So now I'd like to go ahead and introduce the members of the committee that wrote the report who are here with us today. Chris Field, Chair of the Committee, and Perry L. McCarty, Director of the Stanford Woods Institute for the Environment. Albert Lim, Professor of Law, University of California Davis School of Law, and Kate Rickey, Assistant Professor in the School of Global Policy and Strategy at the University of California, San Diego, and faculty member at the Scripps Institution of Oceanography. And with that, I'll turn it over to Dr. Field. Thank you, Megan. And thank you all for joining us today. We're excited to share the findings in the new Academy's report, Reflecting Sunlight, Recommendations for Solar Geoengineering Research, and research governance. I want to run through some of the background material and conclusions and programmatics, and then I'll turn the conversation over to Al Lin, who will talk about the governance issues, and to Kate Rickey, who will talk about the specifics of the research program. Next slide, please. And there's no question that we live now in a world where the impacts of a changing climate are, are real and widespread. We're seeing impacts all the way from the very warm temperatures that we saw in 2020 to unprecedented events like the recent landslide in India, uh, the horrific wildfires in Australia and the Western US, and the unprecedented number of tropical hurricanes we saw in the, in the 2020 in the Atlantic. N no question that we live in an era of climate change, but at the same time, next slide, we're seeing responses that are ambitious in some locations, but falling far, far short of the amount of progress we need to see in order to stabilize warming at one of the ambitious goals that's consistent with the Paris Agreement. As a consequence of this, next slide, we're beginning to see increased attention to outside the box type approaches and beginning to see an increased conversation about whether these outside the box approaches ought to be part of the portfolio of response options for climate change. And that includes a, a number of technologies that we might call geoengineering and particularly uh, geoengineering investments in either changing the amount of sunlight that reaches the earth's surface or geoengineering that modifies properties of the atmosphere to allow additional heat radiation to escape from the surface of the earth. Next slide. And those are the technologies that we considered in this report. We looked at attempts to moderate warming by increasing the amount of sunlight that the atmosphere reflects back to space or by reducing the trapping of outgoing thermal radiations, looking at three major technology options stratospheric aerosol injection, which involves modifying the properties of the stratosphere to make it reflect more sunlight, marine cloud brightening, modifying the properties of clouds close to the surface of the ocean in order to make them reflect more sunlight, or cirrus cloud thinning, and investment in making high elevation clouds more transparent to heat that's being released from the surface of the earth. Next slide. 
The beginning of this report really came from earlier Academy's work on climate intervention. And that 2015 report concluded that these technologies are uh, scientifically interesting, but so poorly known that we really don't have a solid foundation for even a mature discussion about whether they should be included in the portfolio of options. And the 2015 report recommended that until we have a research program, we won't really be able to have that conversation in a sophisticated way. And so based on the recommendation of the 2015 report, we launched the effort that we're describing now to describe a research program and a research governance effort in order to moderate that. The charge to the committee, next slide, was basically to set up a research agenda that pulls in all of the relevant disciplines, that's focused on providing decision relevant knowledge, and that looks broadly at the potential impacts, positive and negative of these tech technologies, and that also looks at um, the requirements for creating a robust environment of governance so that any research that does proceed, proceeds in an environment that's broadly understood, that's transparent, and that is um, open for, for future learning. Next slide. This study was not called for by Congress, as many National Academy studies are, but was really grounded in the recommendation from the 2015 study, and financial support for the work came from a number of philanthropic entities and from federal agencies. Next slide. This committee was composed of a broad range of experts with technical expertise ranging from atmospheric chemistry to philosophy, and with uh, home institutions ranging from the US to India. Uh, incredibly broad committee from which I learned a, a huge amount. Next slide. The study process was uh, typical for National Academies reports as Megan described at the outset. We really made an investment in looking not only at the scientific and technical literature, but in holding a number of fora in which experts representing diverse parts of the scientific and public community were encouraged to provide input on the topics, to uh, make sure that perspectives from different parts of the community were heard, and to really establish a foundation for committee deliberations. And of course, like all Academy's report, this one underwent rigorous peer review, revision, and response to those reviews. Next slide. There are really five key messages that we hope everyone takes away from this report. The first is that given the risks of climate change, it's important to understand the feasibility, the risks and the benefits of solar geoengineering as a possible addition to the portfolio of response strategies. This is not to say that the committee is advocating for deployment or that it's advocating against deployment, but that we simply don't have the information to make mature decisions at this point without additional information. But regardless of that, it is clear already that solar geoengineering is not a substitute for reducing greenhouse gas emissions. To the extent that it's considered at all, it should only be considered as um, a complement to other efforts to reduce greenhouse gas emissions. It's really important to recognize that the current state of understanding of solar geoengineering is not sufficient for supporting informed policy decisions and next steps should focus on providing that information. And that gets us to the primary recommendation for the study, which is that the US should establish in coordination with other countries, a transdisciplinary solar geoengineering research program coordinated by the US Global Change Research Program. Basically, unless uh, we have a coordinated program, it's hard to imagine us answering the key questions that need to be answered in order to make policy relevant decisions. But any research that goes forward should go forward under robust governance 
governance that assures um, that the public is aware of what's going on, has a chance to participate, and can shape the directions of the research. Next slide. It, a really critical starting point is that solar geoengineering may be able to decrease some kinds of impacts of climate change, but it's not a substitute for other efforts. In particular, it doesn't address the root cause of climate change. There's still just as much carbon dioxide and other greenhouse gases in the atmosphere after soil geoengineering as there is before. It raises new concerns about risks, uncertainties, and unintended impacts. And the amount of research to date is quite limited so that we don't have a clear perspective on what those risks, uncertainties, and unintended impacts are. There's pretty good evidence at this point that none of the solar geoengineering technologies have the potential to allow us to dial in a preferred previous climate and reach that with high fidelity. And then finally, the fact that these strategies are basically masking warming that's built into the system as a result of the high levels of greenhouse gases means that if we were ever to stop geoengineering after deploying it at high levels, there's a high probability of catastrophically rapid warming under those conditions. So there are really a lot of cautionary notes that need to be present at the very start of the discussion. Let me summarize where we are with each of the three main technologies in terms of our current understanding. Next slide. Stratospheric aerosol injection, best known of the technologies. We understand a significant amount about stratospheric aerosol injection, mainly from observations of past volcanic eruptions, but also from computer studies. And it's pretty clear that stratospheric aerosols can result in a planetary cooling, but it's much less clear what the spatial distribution is, how controllable it is, and whether or not there might be regional scale weather disruptions that could be either beneficial or harmful. Next slide. Marine Cloud brightening also was supported by a substantial body of existing literature showing, especially from observations of ship tracks, that brighter clouds can reflect more radiation and potentially produce cooling. What we don't know is the global scale at which it might be practical to increase the brightness of low level clouds and whether or not this really has potential to operate at, at more than the local scale. Next slide. The least understood of the three main technologies is cirrus cloud thinning. Computer studies on the potential of changing the properties of high elevation clouds to alter global temperature are conflicting with some results indicating real potential and other results indicating that it's unlikely to work. So very preliminary, but uh, worthy of future study. Next slide. Let me say just a, a, a few things about the conclusions that, that set up the, the program. So after looking at the literature, it's really clear that a successful program really needs to integrate physical, social, and ethical research dimensions, that the key questions that need to be answered have dimensions that are in the natural sciences and engineering spaces, but they also have key dimensions that are in the social sciences and ethical dimensions, and that focusing on one aspect or another is likely to lead to distorted conclusions and won't provide the critical information that's necessary. It's also necessary that these different research threads proceed in parallel so that each can inform the others. Next slide. There has been some research on solar geoengineering at the scale of a few million dollars a year globally, but the current state of understanding is limited and fragmented with substantial knowledge gaps. And it's really clear that the information that's available to date does not provide a sufficient basis for supporting informed decisions. Next slide. It's also clear that 
Currently, we don't have anything like a coordinated or systematic governance of solar geoengineering research. And that's really important for moving forward. There are, in contrast, a number of other international issues for which the context provides a good opportunity for learning and adopting best principles for the development of a, of a solar geoengineering research governance landscape. Next slide. When we look at what kinds of research will be most useful for the near term, the focus should be on better characterizing and reducing uncertainties concerning the risks of deployment and that the next opportunities really come in the space of new knowledge to inform decision makers. But it's important to recognize that this isn't a topic where one additional experiment or a hundred additional experiments are likely to tamp the level of uncertainty down to uh, being trivial or unimportant. And in the future, we're gonna have to continue to think about a pathway that allows us to make important decisions under uncertainty, recognizing that there are limits to how much it can be reduced. Next slide. And in order to make the most progress possible in reducing uncertainty, it's important to have a research program that really links perspectives across disciplines, across geographic regions, and across perspectives. That's important not only for the essential knowledge to be gained, but also to build trust and legitimacy. And then finally, it's important to recognize that any research endeavor is gonna have important path dependencies. And we need to remember at the outset that if we're trying to create an environment that is supportive of good decision-making, that we have to pay attention to the issues of transparency, openness, trust, and legitimacy from the outset. Okay, I want to, I want to turn now to two recommendations from the programmatic perspective that sort of frame where we think this enterprise should go. Next slide. First of all, the committee recommends that the US should implement a robust portfolio of climate mitigation and adaptation. That has to be the top priority, not solar geoengineering. But in addition, given the urgency of climate change concerns and the need for a full understanding of a possible response options, the US should establish in coordination with other countries, a transdisciplinary solar geoengineering research program. In follow on remarks, you'll hear more about what that program should look like but the focus should be on developing policy relevant knowledge rather than advancing a path to deployment. And the research should be designed such that if the findings indicate that deployment is not feasible, desirable, or practical from either a, a science engineering perspective or from a social feasibility perspective, there should be paths for terminating the research and not proceeding further. Next slide. We see the overall research enterprise as representing a, a tightly interacted, coordinated process that involves not only the research moving forward, but also governance and engagement moving forward in parallel to get the best possible answers to the research questions and also to build the social license that would be required for making any kind of decision. And, and critical to this is the idea that if it turns out that the research indicates that particular options are not feasible or not attractive, there should be pathways for exiting the research program and terminating the studies, as well as for building them up in areas that do turn out to be attractive. A final recommendation that I wanna discuss concerns uh, coordination of the program, next slide. And currently in the United States, the goal change research is coordinated through the US Global Change Research Program. The same program should be tasked to provide coordination and transparent oversight of the solar geoengineering research program. And that should include coordination across agencies, 
fostering interdisciplinary components, uh, maintaining, ensuring rigorous peer review, maintaining an active database, periodically assessing progress. The solar geoengineering program needs to be carefully coordinated and it needs to be subject to careful management, careful governance, and careful oversight. And let me turn now to comments on the research governance, and those will be provided by my colleague, Al Lin. Thank you, Chris. As noted on a previous slide, there currently is no coordinated governance of solar geoengineering research. Laws developed in other contexts, such as the National Environmental Policy Act, and the Clean Air Act may apply to some experiments. However, these laws, which tend to focus on physical impacts, would not necessarily be triggered by research activities, even outdoor experiments. An earlier slide highlighted the need to take an integrated and evolving approach to research and governance of research. In our deliberations, we explored research governance mechanisms at international, national, and subnational scales taking a broad understanding of what governance might include and the objectives it should serve. Governance encompasses not only domestic statutes, statutes, tort laws, and international treaties, but also codes of conduct, information registries, and other mechanisms. Our governance recommendations are directed to a wide range of stakeholders in solar geoengineering research, including funders of research, science agencies, national governments, international bodies, and researchers themselves. We crafted our recommendations to address risks of research, build public confidence in the research process and research outcomes, and help ensure that research in appropriate areas gets done. Next slide, please. With respect to governance, our chief recommendation is that a US national research program should operate under robust research governance and support the eventual development or designation of international governance mechanisms. What might robust research governance look like? In recommendation 5.1, we call for a number of governance mechanisms to promote information sharing and coordination of research while fostering transparency, public engagement, and risk and impact assessment. While the committee envisions that these recommendations would be acted upon in their totality, any of them individually is worth pursuing. We don't have time here to cover all the recommended governance mechanisms in detail, but I'd like to discuss several recommendations to provide a sense of them. Next slide, please. One set of recommendations calls for solar geoengineering researchers to adhere to a code of conduct and for funders of research to require adherence to a code of conduct as a condition of funding. Although principles for solar geoengineering research and the code of conduct have been proposed, at present there is no formally sanctioned or widely adopted code. Our recommendation spells out what we expect researchers to commit to in a code of conduct, including protecting the scientific quality of the research, assessing potential adverse effects, avoiding atmospheric experiments with detectable climate or other environmental effects, making research activities and results public, and providing for suitable levels of public and stakeholder participation and engagement. Another set of recommendations involves assessments, reviews, and permitting. For outdoor solar geoengineering atmospheric experiments, we recommend the establishment of a permitting requirement which would incorporate impact assessment and public notice requirements. Next slide, please. Assessments and reviews should not be limited to the level of individual experimentation. They also should be done at a programmatic level to consider the cumulative develop developmental trajectory of solar geoengineering research activities. Accordingly, we recommend that any country engaged in solar geoengineering research establish a standing advisory body composed of experts from a range of disciplines and representatives of potentially affected communities. Such a body would recommend policies and practices on research and research governance. We further recommend the preparation of regular programmatic assessments that collectively assess the health, environmental, and social impact of all solar geoengineering research activities that a country sponsors or approves and any research program it adopts. 
such assessments should incorporate broad and meaningful public engagement and protocols for public engagement. On the matter of public engagement, the committee is of the view that broad and diverse participation and engagement are essential if solar geoengineering research is to be viewed as legitimate, useful, and deserving of public support. It can help avoid the perception that solar geoengineering could be developed by one party or a small number of parties without international input or cooperation. Our recommendations urge the prioritization of inclusive and equitable participation in solar geoengineering research, research governance, and public engagement efforts. Next slide, please. Many of these recommendations could be adopted at subnational, national, or international levels. At the international level, the committee noted the likely challenges of achieving multilateral consensus on solar geoengineering, as well as the tendency for global agreements to evolve after domestic standards have been established. Although governance mechanisms are more likely to be first adopted domestically, various steps can occur now at the international level. One of our recommendations in this area is that funders of solar geoengineering research should promote international cooperation, including with participants from the Global South, within research teams by giving priority to research efforts that include substantial international membership or institutional cooperation. Next slide, please. Before turning things over to Kate, I'd like to highlight one other recommendation, which pertains specifically to outdoor experiments that involve releasing substances into the atmosphere. We recommend that such experiments be considered only when they can provide critical observations not already available or likely to become available through laboratory studies, modeling, and experiments of opportunity. Outdoor experiments involving the release of substances into the atmosphere should be subject to governance, including the impact assessment, permitting system, and public engagement I've highlighted. In addition, any outdoor substance releases should be limited to a quantity of material at least two orders of magnitude smaller than that which could cause detectable changes in global mean temperature or adverse environmental effects. Kate will now discuss our recommendations regarding the research agenda. Thank you, Al. Uh, next slide, please. So I'm going to give you an introductory overview now of the research agenda we proposed. Rather than organizing a research agenda around disciplinary fields of study, we proposed 13 clusters of interdisciplinary research questions that target decision relevant uncertainties. There are considerable linkages and overlaps among these clusters. They shouldn't be viewed as isolated silos of research. To make it easier to grasp the diverse array of topics, we've grouped them into three broad categories. The first, context and goals for solar geoengineering research is um, an atypical category in that it focuses on research which will improve the solar geoengineering research enterprise itself. It thus underlies how all the research in this overall agenda will be approached. There are four clusters under this category which identify research questions about program development pathways, future conditions, integrated decision analysis, and capacity building. The second broad category, impacts and technical dimensions, includes five clusters, which we identify research questions about atmospheric processes, climate response, other impacts of solar geoengineering, monitoring and attribution, and technology development and assessment. Finally, the third category, social dimensions, includes four clusters, which identify research questions about public perceptions and engagement, political and economic dynamics, governance, and ethics. I'm going to walk through a couple of examples of research clusters from each category now. Next slide, please. So for example, under context and goals, we have a research cluster on program development pathways. This is recognizing that there are important researchable questions still about how to conduct solar geoengineering research. 
The committee envisions significant roles for, uh, for example, social scientists who study science policy here, STS scholars, and some example research questions that would be conducted under this cluster include how and by whom would decisions be made to abandon a solar geoengineering research program or to proceed with further development and deployment? How and by whom are the scientific questions identified? Uh, next slide, please. This, um, another example in this category, uh, research cluster three is on integrated decision analysis. This is recognizing this principal goal of solar geoengineering research as characterizing and reducing uncertainty. So this cluster focuses on questions about how to address decision relevant uncertainties about solar geoengineering in a holistic way. We envision roles for disciplines such as risk analysis, integrated assessment modeling, and decision theory here with research activities such as the development of more empirically parameterized models of the relationship between climate variables and socioeconomic outcomes to, for example, support integrated assessment modeling based analyses or um, the advancement of application of methods for decision making under deep uncertainty to solar geoengineering. Next slide, please. Okay, in the area of impacts and technical dimensions, the atmospheric processes cluster focuses on questions around the chemical and physical processes that produce the radiative effects of solar geoengineering. This cluster would include research activities ranging from higher resolution simulations to observational laboratory and potentially outdoor experiments. It would, the activities occurring in this cluster will, will differ considerably by the type of solar geoengineering. So for example, for stratospheric aerosol injection, the type of research questions that might be addressed here include um, what is the rate of formation and growth of particles with different injection schemes? How um, would the wake of aircraft affect plume dispersal? And for marine cloud brightening, it might include questions such as what are the interactions between injected aerosols and clouds? How much brightening will result? How long will the brightening persist? And the like. Next slide, please. This is a research cluster on other impacts, cluster seven. It focuses on assessment of environmental and societal impacts of solar geoengineering proposals. Uh, the committee envisions a broad range of disciplines that would be involved with this research. Uh, the same ones that currently conduct climate impacts assessment ranging from ecology to economics some research needs that we've identified include the development of detailed understanding of solar geoengineering's effects on a broader range of climatic and biogeochemical variables and on socio-ecological systems, empirical studies of possible economic impacts of solar geoengineering, and downscaling of simulations for impacts assessment. Next slide, please. Okay, in the social dimensions category, uh, research cluster 10 uh, focuses on public perceptions and engagement. This is work that could be led by social and behavioral scientists. Some of the example research questions that we've identified are what are effective practices for meaningful public engagement in solar geoengineering research and research governance? who are the relevant publics and how should engagement take place? How do cultural worldviews and differing attitudes toward risk affect perceptions of solar geoengineering issues? Um, and next slide, please. And a final example, research cluster 13 is on ethics. This, uh, we envision research that could be led by scholars from disciplines such as philosophy and law examining the ethical implications of a broad range of questions, um, such as on justice and equity, questions such as how to take into account the full range of ethical perspectives 
questions on research, such as which values and principles should guide field experiments, questions on governance, such as um, what ethical principles should guide governance of potential deployment and quest ethical questions about deployment, management, monitoring, and termination. Next slide, please. Okay, with that, I'll, I'll turn things back to Chris Field. Thank you, Kate and Al. I want to say just a few words about what a federal budget might look like over the next few years, and then provide a couple of closing thoughts. Consistent with our emphasis on maintaining the focus on decarbonization, it's important to have a budget that doesn't pull resources away from those key concerns. It's also important to have a, a budget that doesn't increase concerns about uh, putting us on a slippery slope to deployment or a budget that doesn't inadvertently take attention away from decarbonization. After uh, considering the options, the committee recommends that the overall spending on soil geoengineering research at the federal level over the next five years should be on the order of 100 to $200 million cumulatively. This represents a small slice of the non-satellite global change research budget, something on the order of two to 4%, but it also represents a big uptick, a several fold increase in the total amount of money that's going into solar geoengineering research, consistent not only with the importance of the questions, but with the existing capacity of the research community to take advantage of that kind of funding. It's really important that <clears throat> as funding becomes available for this agenda, that it's used to support all of the research activities from the natural science and engineering all the way to the social science and ethical components in the most integrated way possible if we're to achieve full benefits. Some aspects of this research are, however, more expensive than others, and that includes major field campaigns involving aircraft or ships or lots of individuals who need to be deployed to remote locations. And the budget should be structured to accommodate those kinds of major field campaigns. It's also important to recognize that there's a lot we don't know about what directions the research is going to go. And in response to that, we need to allocate part of the budget to be distributed dynamically based on what we learn in other parts of the program. And then a final component that's really critical for structuring the budget is that the budget structure needs to include support for the governance parts and the public engagement parts from the start. They can't be viewed as, as uh, afterthoughts or add-ons. That's illustrated in the next slide, where you can see that in addition to the three core investments in context and goals, social dimensions, and impacts and technical dimensions, there should be a substantial part of the budget that's dynamically allocated based on the emerging evidence of where the greatest needs are. And there should be a substantial part of the budget that's allocated to oversight, management, governance, and public engagement. Next slide. Let me close with just a, a couple of thoughts. So ultimately the goal is to find an appropriate balance among all the strategies for responding to climate change. It's not to push solar geoengineering uh, to the front of the line, and it's not to advocate for deployment of solar geoengineering. It's really to figure out a whether or not further consideration of solar geoengineering ought to be part of the portfolio of response strategies. The recommendations that we're making are recommendations for an initial exploratory phase of a research program over the longer term, the program might expand or it might contract, and it might uh, lead to big new efforts or it might be terminated. We put a lot of emphasis on addressing feasibility, but it's important to remember that when we talk about feasibility, we mean not only technical feasibility, but also social feasibility, uh, acceptance, buy-in, support, the kinds of public issues that are as likely to control whether or not any of these technologies are practical as any of the science or engineering efforts. 
And let me finally just close with a comment that the committee has really tackled this problem from the perspective that the idea should be that as additional information becomes available, if solar geoengineering continues to look promising, uh, there should be further investment and development. If the evidence indicates that it's not promising or that there are uh, technical, social, even philosophical challenges that can't be overcome, then the research process needs to be open to terminating the effort. It's really an investment in developing decision relevant science and not in advocating for any particular outcome. With that, I wanna thank you for your attention and we look forward to your questions. The next slide provides information on getting the report. All right, thank you all so much for that presentation. Um, at this point, we are gonna open it up to questions from the audience. So as a remember to ask a question, just type it into the box below your video player. Um, the first question I wanna ask is, uh, what about this moment do you think makes it the right time for the academies to provide updated recommendations on solar geoengineering research and governance? I'll start with just a, a couple of quick comments. And I think as we started out, it's really a time of a critical juncture in our tackling of climate change. <coughs> We're, we're not making the progress we should. We're seeing a renewed focus on climate change responses, climate change solutions. And I think it's important for everyone to have access to the best available information about which solutions options are promising, which ones aren't, and where we can head in the future. We're far from ready to see any kind of recommendations about solar geoengineering and the research endeavor that we're proposing over five years will begin to provide some of the key pieces of information, but it's really too early to say whether or not we're likely to see sufficient information after five years to be able to make clear decisions one way or the other. Great, thank you, Chris. Our next question is, are any other countries looking seriously at solar geoengineering at this point? Are the concerns and interests of other countries similar to those identified in this new report for the US or are they notably different in some ways? There are a number of committee members who were really focused on the international landscape. And I would encourage one of them to make a comment at this point. Um, Peter Frumhoff, would you like to comment on the international agenda? Sure. Hi, everybody. So there certainly are other countries, uh, China and others that have been uh, doing some initial exploration researchers in other countries. Uh, and we didn't, uh, we, we sought input from uh, both researchers and um, civil society perspectives from other nations in the developing of our recommendations. Um, I think where we landed, as Chris and others highlighted, was to make sure that uh, the report itself while focused on a US research program, uh, was intentional in making recommendations about international coordination and the development of international uh, collaboration in research, as well as the design of international governance mechanisms. We're not in a position to obviously design what a program in another country should look like. Um, we certainly think that many of the recommendations, for example, about codes of conduct, about registries for uh, uh, research uh, 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 permitting processes and so on could be adopted at national levels in other nations. Um, and I believe that there'll be conversations taking place beyond the release of this report, for example, with other national academies in other countries uh, to explore whether these recommendations might be suitable for consideration by relevant bodies in other nations. And during the development of the report, we made an intensive investment in soliciting perspectives from other countries. I, I might ask Ambush Sagar, who's a committee member from India, to speak to the um, perspectives on solar geoengineering about a US-led program from an international perspective. Um, thank you, Chris. Um, so I, I would actually think, um, before I even get to that, I think I um, do want to highlight that while there are some countries that have uh, research programs in solar geoengineering, there are many who do not. And given the nature of this issue, um, which is uh, obviously going to be global in perspective, 
uh, it is important for other countries to start thinking about uh, at least uh, engaging with this question in some way, and hopefully this report will catalyze that kind of a that kind of a um, effort. Uh, in terms of in terms of coordinating with the U.S. led, -led effort, I think uh, the report does talk about the fact that it, uh, in in some sense, that it it is a a, 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 a kind of a kind of a coordinated process where uh, decision making really, in some senses, is intended to be. Uh, to be shared, and therefore, uh, uh, while we are while while we are saying that the process is U.S. led, it's certainly the way we are envisaging it would involve. And I think for a country like India, I could very well imagine that uh, there would be some learning from the U.S. experience, but then thinking about that about how to design its own program that dovetails with that of U.S. and other countries, such that uh, decision makers in India could think about this question as and when it becomes more relevant to that kind of decision making. Thank you. Thank you all for those responses. Um, is the panel concerned that for solar geoengineering research, uh, the horse has already left the stable ungoverned, uh, not just for federal research, but also academic and private sector activities? There is some research that's going on and, and some of the leading so the geoengineering researchers are, are members of the committee. Let me ask some of the researchers who are actively involved in this field to weigh in with their perspective about how creation of a U.S. program and the governance that we're proposing will enhance or detract from or influence the research that's already ongoing. Might start with Doug McMartin. Thanks, Chris. Um, so I would say overall, the level of funding to date uh, is relatively small, so measured in millions of dollars per year. Uh, and there, most of that uh, has, in fact, virtually all of that has been modeling type work. Uh, and so there are certainly some researchers in the field who are interested in conducting field experiments. Uh, and so that's sort of, uh, in some sense, a, a motivator for saying we need to start thinking about how to do the uh, get the governance in place. So I don't think it's uh, I don't think it's the horse has left the stable left the barn at all. Um, there is, and I'll also point out that there have already been discussions among the research community about codes of conduct. Uh, there hasn't been anything formally adopted, uh, but those discussions have already started, and there are draft codes of conduct available. So I think this would simply add uh, and start thinking about how one might uh, make sure that the governance is in place for, uh, to the extent that there's any external outdoor research that's being conducted. And I might ask Lisa Dilling to comment on the social science perspective on implications of research that's already ongoing. Um, thanks, Chris. Um, yeah, I think there has been quite a lot of social science research and ethical research, eth research and ethics in this topic. Um, and so far, it has been ad hoc and on, you know, individual bases. But I think that this, um, this is a welcome um, movement, I think, towards trying to bring together that research in more co close coordination with other kinds of research, like the physical research, physical science research that's been going on. Um, but there has been over a decade, 15 years or so of research looking at public perceptions in um, solar ge geoengineering, for example, um, and looking at not, not only perceptions of deployment, but actually the research itself. Um, and there's been quite a lot of um, acceleration of that research, I would say, in the last few years. So I would think that this would be, um, you know, this is a good basis from which to go forward on a, on a larger program. Thank you. Thank you both. Um, that's a nice lead into our next question, which asks about um, one particular ethical concern, um, specifically the concern that the maturation of solar geoengineering will provide mankind with an out from having to reduce our carbon emissions. Could the panel talk a little bit more about what the report says um, on this point? Let me just start by commenting that we had really extensive discussions about thinking how to design a program that doesn't uh, create an out that doesn't deter mitigation. 
but it is a complicated ethical issue. And maybe our philosopher, Marian Hordekin, would like to speak to the, the way she sees the ethical issues sorting out. Sure. Um, thanks, Chris. I appreciate uh, the opportunity to respond to this question. I mean, this idea of mitigation, deterrence, or moral hazard has been a really significant um, concern ever since people started talking about and researching solar geoengineering, um, and I think it continues to be to be a concern. There has been some um, social science research trying to figure out um, whether uh, research on solar geoengineering is likely uh, to deter um, to, to de deter um, investment in mitigation and sort of public focus and policy focus on mitigation. I think the jury's sort of still out, but it's also the case that what we do now will shape whether mitigation deterrence happens or not. And so I think one of the, uh, just to underscore something that Chris said, I think one of the important efforts uh, in the program design is to really think about how um, important it is to continue to foreground mitigation and adaptation, um, to move cautiously in terms of the level of financial investment in this research, um, and then also to really uh, engage in a research program that's subject to ongoing assessment, um, diverse public and stakeholder engagement, um, and that researches um, other strategies sort of iteratively as we move forward um, that can safeguard against mitigation deterrence. So I think part of our work, uh, part of the work of the research program will be to continue to think about um, how program design can be refined in ways that um, ensure that decarbonization remains central. This is such an important issue that I would... Um encourage any other committee members who'd like to speak to it to make a quick comment. But that was also a great answer, so maybe we can go on. Thank you all. Um, our next question is in a, a, a similar vein. Um, the history of weather and climate intervention includes many examples of military involvement. Um, so can we assume that future research on this topic will be transparent and public when in the past it has not been? When we talk about provide, developing a program that assesses technical feasibility as well as social feasibility, we're working from the starting position that openness and transparency and engagement are going to be key enablers. You know, I, I would say that the committee perspective has come from the orientation that um, a secret program uh, unlikely to be successful because it, even if it does figure out some of the technical aspects, won't have access to figuring out what social conditions would be absolutely fundamental to being able to deploy a program like this. So in, in any kind of a rational world, the role for um, hidden research for confidential research should be really, really limited. And we hope that in establishing a program that's open and transparent, the value of this kind of approach is rapidly revealed. I don't know if anybody else from the committee would like to weigh in on this one. Important issue. Lisa, I think you have your hand up. You can go ahead if you have something you'd like to add. Oh, sure. And I see Al has his, had his hand up first if he wants to go. Go ahead, Lisa, and I'll I, I was just going to emphasize what Chris said, but also to say, again, to return to the important um, piece, the, the, the equally important part of this report is about governance mechanisms. I think that's what Al is going to speak to. He was the lead on that, or one of the leads on that chapter. Um, but the, it's, uh, the, the question of military, um, you know, the military research in this area, we didn't deal specifically with that, but our, our, whole, um, our whole recommendation and governance rests on transparency and public engagement um, of uh, being, being completely open about the kinds of research that are going forward 
And I, I would, I'm not an expert in this, but my guess is that the military control of this would be not conducive to a transparent research program. So that, that's, uh, we really have this as a fundamental building block of our governance mechanisms is to be transparent. Yes, and what I would add is that, you know, the, some of the specific governance mechanisms, in addition to the ones that I already uh, mentioned earlier, include, you know, establishment of a res research registry where researchers would be expected to, um, you know, make their experiments as well as their ultimate data and findings available, uh, you know, on that registry, uh, as well as other mechanisms that we recommend for transparency. Um, and that the fact that these uh, recommendations are aimed towards not just, uh, let's say, the government, but to the researchers themselves, uh, to funders of researchers, et cetera, I think uh, would you know, help to uh, ensure that uh, transparency uh, would be promoted. Thanks. Thank you both. Um, what are the environmental justice issues associated with solar geoengineering? And were any of the identified uh, research needs in your report related to environmental justice? Really, really important issue. And of course, the environmental justice components have numerous dimensions. They range from the important dimension of which communities are most susceptible, vulnerable to the impacts of climate change and which benefit most from limiting climate change. Uh, they have elements that are related to decision-making about paths forward and enabling voices from across the spectrum to play a role in the decision-making to uh, the possibility that some of these geoengineering technologies might specifically disadvantage areas where people are already vulnerable. And a lot of the emphasis on the design of the research program is to make sure that there are pathways for hearing from diverse communities around the world, communities that can express um, you know, their preferences about the design of the research, the goals of the research, the uh, prioritization of, of different kinds of outcomes. And those issues need to be integrated into a big picture that also includes the, the natural science and engineering components. I, I don't think there's a way to address the environmental justice issues without listening to um, vulnerable communities around the world. And it'll be a critical part of the research moving forward. And uh, Lisa, go ahead. I, I would just add to that that it, we also did discuss the um, need to broaden the suite of researchers engaged in this type of research. Um, it has tended to be Global North researchers that have been involved in this research. And perhaps my colleague Anne Bush will speak to this as well. But that, that was a, an, a component of environmental justice that we felt was really important to discuss in the report, which is who is doing this research and to be broadening that um, group of researchers. Yeah, and if I may add to that, uh, I think an important component of environmental justice is capacity. Uh, both capacity to understand the kind of questions that uh, might be raised by an issue such as this and how to engage with them. And uh, so we've explicitly kind of talked about that in the report, both about the importance of capacity for uh, as part of the research of, 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 of this uh, building a robust research program, but also capacity itself as a topic of research uh, to, to better understand the kinds and the dimensions of capacity that might be needed in order for uh, disadvantaged communities and uh, across the world uh, and, and uh, developing countries and so on to be able to engage with this, with this kind of issue. And I, I, to me, at least, I think the capacity question really goes to the heart of how to um, uh, get environment, you know, how to be, have a more just uh, outcome in the environmental domain. Thank you. Uh, why don't we take one more question? That's great. Yeah, we are getting close to time. Um, our last question today is, what do you want people working in climate change research or working on solar geoengineering research now 
the full spectrum of intersecting disciplines that touch this issue. What are you hoping that these people take away from your report as they read it um, and talk to you and hear from you more as a committee over the next few weeks? That's a, a really great question. You know, so often we think about National Academies reports as, as being targeted primarily at the funders or at the uh, agencies that might implement the programs. But what we really hope is that the research community begins to think broadly about these issues and integrates questions about solar geoengineering into their own thinking. We also really see the transdisciplinary model that we're proposing as being uh, foundational for all kinds of climate related science moving forward. And that until we really understand the um, climate issue was one that involves uh, ecosystems, economies, communities, and vulnerable people around the world, we're not going to be making the kind of progress we should. So hopefully this report will be an inducement to think broadly and ambitiously about climate change solutions, but also to think broadly and ambitiously about the design and structure of future research programs. We're a little bit over time. It's been a real pleasure to work on this topic that's so important and has the potential to really change the way the world works. Uh, I had a unique pleasure to work with just an amazing committee and an amazing National Academies team on this. So thanks so much to everyone. Thank you all so much for tuning in with us today. Um, and thank you to the committee for their presentation. And I'm sure we're all uh, looking forward to hearing more from you over the next couple of weeks. And so thank you for your time.